May 1984. A woman is approached while enjoying a drink at a local bar. Days later, a man offers to fix a young woman's stalled car. Elsewhere, another woman is leaving a mall on the outskirts of Tulsa, Oklahoma, when a man approaches. None of these women are ever seen again. They really didn't have any key suspects. Uh, we were looking for individuals, possibly family members that might have been angry. We had the elements of a serial killer, a crime spree, a chase. For the people of Oklahoma, it's an unprecedented set of events. When people start showing up dead every few days, it scared the whole town and the whole area. In 1984, Tulsa, Oklahoma was a former oil capital that had hit hard times, but it still had a valuable resource in its inhabitants. Everybody knows everybody. A lot of people left their doors unlocked, their windows unlocked, and it was a place where you really enjoyed to live and it was a great community. We have a couple of religious universities here in town and uh, conservative people family people. It was the same story in smaller communities nearby, like Broken Arrow. Crime rate was rather low. You had your typical burglaries and, and that type of crimes, but as far as homicides and that type of major crimes, it was a real low for this area. In May 1984, 63-year-old Eddie Cash was doing what he loved helping the sick and lonely. He was very compassionate, very caring about people. He was always helping people. And he had developed a ministry to sick and shut-in people, especially people in nursing homes. He visited them almost every day. A widower for three years, he'd just retired from his caretaking job at a local cemetery and was always ready for a chat. Dad would come to my house in the mornings, right about the time my kids were getting up and getting ready to leave, have breakfast and leave for school. And he'd either have coffee with them or help them do their breakfast because I'd be getting ready to go to work. The 7th of May, Eddie was on his way to visit a sick relative in Collinsville, Oklahoma. While driving down the road, he spotted a hitchhiker who also happened to be heading to the same small town. He offered him a ride. He uh, would always pick up hitchhikers, especially if he was traveling alone. He would pick up people. During the trip, he told the stranger about his life and his home. Dropping him off, Eddie went on his way. He visited some family and friends and returned to his residence in Broken Arrow. The next morning, Eddie Cash's daughter waited for his morning visit, but he didn't show up. I had tried to call when I first got up to see if he was home. And the phone rang and rang and rang, and I picked up the phone and called again, and the phone rang busy. I called work and I said, I'm going to be late. I've gone to my dad's house. I haven't seen him and I'm going to go check on him. When she arrived at his house, Priscilla noticed that his van was nowhere to be seen. When I opened the front door, he was laying inside the front door in a pool of blood. And I was the one that called 911. Police immediately converged on the crime scene. Lead detectives Rick Ross and Homer Miller took charge and put their team of investigators to work. Immediately they set up a perimeter around the area, around the house, and called for additional officers. Outside, they noted that Cash's van was missing. Inside, Eddie Cash had been beaten about the head and strangled. Detectives took photographs of the body and documented the crime scene. They then set about collecting vital evidence. Fingerprints, bloody footprints, hairs, fibers, the brick that we believe was used to strike Mr. Cash with. 
Meanwhile, Ed Cash Jr. was informed of his father's death. I was working on a job in Tulsa and uh, had left for lunch and came back and my aunt was sitting there. Well, I knew immediately when I saw her, there's something wrong. She was very to the point. She just said, you need to sit down. I have something that I have to tell you. And she said, your father has been murdered. I became very angry, very upset. Ed raced to his father's home. The media was also on the scene. Photographers and reporters clamored for any piece of information to publish. Any killings are big news in Tulsa. Officer Paul Crowter was one of the detectives assigned to canvas the area for more information. We located a couple of witnesses that recalled seeing two young men and they were asking for directions to Mr. Cash's residence. And the witness recalled a unusual belt buckle that one of those individuals was wearing. As a close relative, Ed Cash Jr. became a suspect. They were doing a thorough investigation. They were eliminating anyone that might have been involved. I realized immediately that I was a suspect because of the questions they were asking. Where I was, could I prove where I was? Because usually people kill people they know. We were looking for individuals, possibly family members that might have uh, been angry with Mr. Cash, and none of those leads uh, or trails panned out. Although he was soon cleared of suspicion, when Ed arrived back at his own home, he realized the nightmare was far from over. The evening of the funeral, we'd been gone two or three days, and I walked up on the deck, and the television was on. I, I remember distinctly not leaving the TV on, only a light. I started to put the key in the lock and heard someone cough. Ed quickly retreated to a neighbor's house where he phoned the police and borrowed some weapons. Returning to his home armed and ready, he saw a man fleeing into the woods. I felt very angry about it, extremely angry about it, and was very uncomfortable thinking that he could very easily come back. Inside, Ed Cash Jr. found that his rifles had been wrapped in a sheet. The next morning, police dusted the guns for fingerprints and compared them to the suspect's prints taken from the murder scene. They found they were one and the same. From a fingerprint on one of the rifles that was in the house, they said they were reasonably sure that it was him. But detectives Ross and Miller still didn't know who the prints belonged to. And with no other suspects, their investigation faltered. They came to a dead end because they were not able to identify the fingerprints through sources that they had available to them at the time. I figured they would eventually catch him because the thing that I was concerned about was my sister and my immediate family. I was very concerned that he had gotten information that would lead him to one of us. While the Eddie Cash incident was unfolding, in the nearby community of Poto, Oklahoma, a man approached 36-year-old Margaret Bell in a bar and struck up a conversation. My mom was probably the true image of a hippie a very intelligent person, um, very open-minded, liked everybody and loved life. She had just moved back to Poto to be closer to friends and family, because this is where she grew up. Margaret's daughter, Misty, was especially proud that her mother was a radio DJ working for the family-owned radio station. My grandfather's radio station was on downtown of Poto. And you could see in and see the studio. And I can remember people walking by and seeing her. And 
just thinking it was so cool that they could see her in there and know that she was my mother. Margaret's car had just been fixed and she was anxious to meet up with some friends. She told Misty she planned to stop off at one of her favorite nightclubs later that evening and that she'd see her the next day. I then went by there Wednesday and someone had left a note on her door. So I left a note also. I then went by there Thursday and both the notes were still there. By that Sunday, I had gone several times to the house and all the notes were still there and more. I got real uneasy. Miss D and her grandmother went to the police station to file a missing persons report. I was very uneasy about filling them out because I had in my mind, I already knew something was bad wrong. When the family came in, information was taken about Miss Bell and at that point it was put on the national computer as a, to check her welfare and different agencies were notified to be on, on the lookout. However, at that time, there was not enough evidence to suggest something had gone wrong. At that point, we really didn't uh, have any reason to suspect, you know, any foul play. Initially, we thought she might have just went somewhere and stayed and was just late getting away or getting back home. When another 24 hours passed with no sign of Margaret, Detective Steve Tiffey visited her house to look for clues. We found some credit card bills at the residence, so at that point we notified the credit card company and uh, we learned that the cards had been used in some different states. So we did follow-ups on those credit card uses and trailed it out to a location where we thought she might be headed. But the promising lead did little to console Misty. Mom hadn't called, we hadn't seen her, things were left undone. My grandmother was like, you know, at telling me don't be a pessimist. And I told her I wasn't, I was being a realist. And it wasn't gonna have a happy ending. While the search for Margaret Bell continued, a woman was giving a man a tour of her house in the small town of Vinita, Oklahoma. Jane Hilburn was showing it to a man who said he was interested in buying it. A few hours later, her family came home and found Jane's dead body lying on the floor of the living room. A team of detectives arrived on the scene. From the evidence, the medical examiner easily determined what had happened. And as in the cases of Eddie Cash and Margaret Bell, Jane Hilburn's car was missing. He struck her in the head and strangled her and then took her Camaro. Uh, really, the only difference was the victim in Broken Arrow was a male and the one in, in the Vanita area was a female. Five days later, a young woman contacted the police with a terrifying story. While hitchhiking, she'd been picked up by a man driving a Camaro. Suddenly, he held a knife to her throat. He threw her in the boot, drove her to a deserted location, and raped her. When she promised she wouldn't escape, he let her sit in the car. When he stopped at a bar, she ran for her life. A manhunt for the driver of the Camaro began. A car matching the one described by the rape victim was found three days later. Police impounded the vehicle and checked it for fingerprints. While police were trying to identify the prints, 32-year-old Janet Jewell parked her car in downtown Tulsa and went into a shop, unaware that someone was watching her. When she came out, her car wouldn't start. A passerby offered to look under the bonnet. The next day, Janet Jewell's car was parked at one of Tulsa's shopping malls. Another young woman left the mall and headed for the car park, anxious to get home. Things would not turn out as she planned.
In the spring of 1984, communities in Oklahoma were worried. Within a matter of days, two people had been murdered and several others had been kidnapped and raped. 25-year-old Valerie Shaw Hartzell, a well-known radio journalist from Tulsa, had been watching the news with great interest. Good reporter, always upbeat, competent. I worked at a different radio station. She worked for a rival station, but it was a friendly rivalry. We were in the same broadcast courses at the University of Tulsa. Really nice person. She was very strong-willed, had an opinion. She was very confident about herself. She was also a friend of Ed Cash, Jr. We used to go out to disco places, dancing a lot with the group. And uh, then she met the man that she married. On the 25th of May, 1984, Valerie's husband was waiting for her to return from the shopping mall. She'd gone to buy nappies for their newborn baby and should have been back hours earlier. When Valerie didn't come home for dinner, he became worried and called the police. I was in charge of the Missing Persons Bureau. I made contact with her husband. Uh, in fact, I made the original missing persons report and took over the investigation. As more hours passed, her family became frantic. I went outside and I just started screaming and crying that uh, somebody had her. And it was just, you know, one of those uh, shocking moments where you're just screaming and crying. Meanwhile, the police spoke to witnesses who remembered seeing the high-profile journalist the previous day. She had been seen coming out of a store after she'd gone to buy uh, diapers for her baby. And that a man approached her and subsequently uh, drove off with her. While searching the scene, the police found an abandoned vehicle in the car park of the shopping center where Valerie had disappeared. When police checked it out, they realized Valerie's disappearance was linked to another missing woman, Janet Jewell. The first time we actually put him together is when we found Janet Jewell's car on the parking lot at the Town West Shopping Center. Once that happened, then we discovered that they, they proved that something bad happened to both of them. When news of Valerie's abduction became public, the community was stunned as were the Tulsa newsrooms, where Valerie Shaw Hartzell had become the focus of the kind of story she had normally be covering. When we saw Valerie's name up on the assignment board, you know, as a story, not as just a person, it just changed your whole feeling that day. All of a sudden, it was like, whoa, this is hitting really close to home. The newsroom was pretty solemn. I mean, it's, it's surreal almost. It's like um, it's a television show. It's like it's not really happening. Meanwhile, Valerie had been cashing checks at several drive through banks. A teller recognized her from the media reports and called the police. Unfortunately, we didn't get that information quick enough to be able to get over there and possibly intervene. We were given access to their surveillance film, and that's where we did determine that, yes, that was uh, Ms. Hartzell in the truck, and that there was a uh, unidentified uh, white male in the truck with her. Spillers noted that in the surveillance film, Valerie looked anxious and uncomfortable. His fellow officers agreed that she was not acting of her own free will. The man in the video matched all the eyewitness descriptions but they still couldn't identify him. The police continued their massive search while family members did what they could to help. My husband and I actually, we just got in a car and just drove around. There was no way to know where to look, so we just drove a lot and tried to go by instinct or feel. For Ed Cash Jr., it was especially difficult. Within a matter of days, his father had been murdered 
and a friend had gone missing. He couldn't help but believe that they must be connected. Well, I definitely felt, you know, it has to be someone that I know. And I started immediately thinking of people that, that I knew that had met my father, that had traveled in the group with Valerie and myself. Then caused me to start feeling very uneasy. The way I was really feeling is that I want to get involved in this. I want to find out who it is because I, I want to take care of it. Unlike Ed, most Oklahomans were hoping not to get involved. They were frightened, and especially out west of Tulsa, uh, those people were scared. I think they started locking their doors maybe for the first time ever. I think it was at that point they finally made the connection that it's not just Valerie that this person has abducted or done anything to, that this was somebody who was a serial murderer at that point. By now, it was the 27th of May, three days after she had gone missing, and Valerie was still nowhere to be found. Nor were there any strong leads in the Eddie Cash murder or Margaret Bell's disappearance. The police knew only that Valerie Shaw Hartzell and Janet Jewell had been abducted by the same person. Then, the police received a frantic phone call from a young woman in Venita who told police about a man who'd abducted her at knife point. She called the police right after it happened. He ended up taking her to a, a motel where he raped her, and then she told him that uh, she wanted to help him, and uh, for some reason he let her go. Yeah, she talked about a description, and I, I believe he told her that he was the one that had kidnapped Valerie. Her description of his vehicle matched the truck belonging to Valerie Shaw Hartzell. The police acted immediately. Once we knew that he was still in Valerie's car, we put out an all-points bulletin. And I just couldn't fathom if he was in Tulsa, Oklahoma, why we couldn't find the man. The police now had no doubt that the wave of crimes across Oklahoma were connected. They'd been committed by the same man, and police were under pressure to catch him before he struck again. In May 1984, a series of violent crimes were terrifying the people of Oklahoma. At first, the police had no suspects, and no reason to link the crimes, but the connections soon became clear, especially after a rape victim told police her abductor was driving a vehicle belonging to Valerie Shaw Hartzell, one of the missing women. It was around the 28th, 29th, 30th of May, things started to come together. I was talking with a sheriff's deputy up in Venita. And we were talking about some strange cases he had going, and I was telling him a little bit about our murder here. And the odd thing about it is uh, the suspect descriptions were very similar, even down to a unique belt buckle. By now, there were also several matching physical descriptions of the perpetrator from victims who'd escaped. It's Tulsa police had put together a composite sketch, and that was being shown. We had plastered description all over our newscast, and so had the other news stations and the other newspapers. So the word was out there. The police now assumed they were looking for just one man, and knew generally what he looked like, but were still unable to identify him. Detective Paul Crowder brought Ed Cash Jr. in to look at sketches of the suspect, hoping he could identify the man. Of course, I was very anxious and drove up to see the pictures. And he said, well, do you know this person? And I said, no, I do not know that person. He said, are you sure you do not know him? I said, no, I don't know him. I have no idea who he is at all. And he says, well, do you think your father knew him? I said, not that I know of. I would have no way of knowing that. But the killer was getting sloppy, leaving clues to his identity behind. A pawn shop owner realized one of his customers matched the media descriptions and contacted the police. 
when he took Valerie's truck, he took the club, which is a device that you put on the steering wheel and hooks to the brake. He took that device and pawned it in a uh, pawn shop. But he left his name, and uh, the guy actually looked at his driver's license and took the information off his driver's license. They had a serial number on it, and we were able to trace it back to her. At the same time, a witness came forward with information about the car belonging to Jane Hilburn, the woman who'd been strangled by a man claiming to be interested in buying her house. The witness told police a relative of his had been driving a Camaro a few weeks before, just like the one he'd seen broadcast in the media. He had come to Broken Arrow driving the Vanita victim's Camaro and was wanting to borrow some money from his relative. And we finally was able to put a name to that face. The person everyone was looking for was 30-year-old Gary Allen Walker, an Oklahoma man who had been in trouble for much of his life. He'd begun stealing from his family when he was just a small boy, progressing to more serious burglaries and theft as a young adult. He'd spent more than seven years in prisons and mental institutions, where he was finally diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic and had received at least 20 shock treatments. Gary had quite a few burglaries that he was responsible for. Had a real problem with staying out of trouble back then. I uh, was unable to ever hold a job very long, so he just kind of existed. Now, using Gary Allen Walker's prints, the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation positively identified the set of fingerprints from the Camaro as belonging to Walker. The police knew that the man in Hilburn's Camaro was the one who had raped another woman, so Walker was tied to that crime as well. Steve Tiffey joined forces with authorities from other jurisdictions where similar kinds of murders and abductions had been reported. I believe there's 53 of us met in Tulsa, and we just kind of laid everything out on the table of each one of them's cases and went over it. It was just a joint effort of the whole state of officers and, and some out-of-state officers that kind of put all this together. The final piece in the puzzle was the similarity in crime methods. The murder victims had all been beaten and strangled. The rape victims abducted at knife point. Knowing conclusively the extent of Walker's crime spree, police conducted a nationwide manhunt. We had Broken Arrow Police, Tulsa, Craig County, LaFleur County, FBI, the OSBI. I had agencies over in Arkansas. They probably tapped about every resource they had. And I think they had a helicopter at the time, and it was up in the air. They had uh, dogs out searching. The one downside of all the publicity the case had was that the suspect also had that same information and was able to watch for uh, any of our cars. Of course, he had changed vehicles at least twice, so it was kind of hard to keep up with what he might be driving at the time. The public was on alert, but it was not enough. In early June in Van Buren, Arkansas, Walker broke into a home and threatened to kill its two inhabitants. Walker left them scared but alive, escaping into the night with their vehicle. They summoned the police. And Tulsa already had information of who he was, what he looked like. Somebody had spotted the vehicle at a bar. I got a phone call at home that he had been spotted in a bar we sent officers to that bar, but he had just left and they missed him. He was doing his best to stay one step ahead of us. And for the most part, he was quite successful. But customers at the bar told police that the people Walker had left with lived in a nearby mobile home. The great thing about it was he had left not knowing that we were en route Therefore, he was not really trying to hide from that point as much as he had been. 
Police quickly and quietly surrounded the mobile home. Through the window, they saw Walker having a drink with his friends. Officers rushed the home and burst through the door, catching Walker off guard. They located him and, and arrested him without incident, that we had no problem once he was, once he was cornered. In just a matter of seconds, the police ended a crime spree that had spanned more than three weeks and destroyed many lives. When he was apprehended, I think he was just tired of running. I was relieved in the sense that I knew that he could do no more harm to any of the family. Once in custody, Walker was interrogated by the police who hoped to learn the location of the missing women. The truth was hard to take. Walker told them that Margaret Bell, Valerie Shaw Hartzell, and Janet Jewell were dead. The police visited the victims' families to give them the terrible news. So at that moment, just all hope was gone. Pretty much you just lose it. Everybody's, of course, crying. And and upset. My grandmother came to the house and my grandmother was in tears. I asked her what was wrong and she couldn't answer me and I said, it's mom, isn't it? And she said, yes. And I spent most of the next 30 or 45 minutes trying to comfort my grandmother because she was in such shock. I never hit the shock stage because I had already accepted it before I for sure found out. With the arrest of Gary Allen Walker, a media frenzy broke out. Once they captured Gary Allen Walker, it, it, it just exploded. So we had one crew going out to where the scene of the arrest was. We had another crew going to the courthouse. He uh, confessed to all the crimes that he was linked or suspected of committing, and maybe even some that he wasn't suspected, but he spilled his guts, basically. Holding nothing back, Walker told police how his crime spree had begun. He'd been hitchhiking between Broken Arrow and Collinsville when he was picked up by Eddie Cash. Apparently the man got enough information from Dad to f figure out the area that he lived in and uh, went back to the neighborhood and found out where he lived. Walker told the police he'd originally meant to rob Eddie Cash, not kill him. But when Cash came home unexpectedly, he'd had to do something so Cash couldn't identify him. As he was about to break into the house, Mr. Cash pulled up, which surprised this young man. He jumped into the bushes and waited for Mr. Cash to, to go into his home. So he went up, knocked on the door. When Mr. Cash came to the door, he struck Mr. Cash in the head several times with a brick and then tied a electrical cord around Mr. Cash's neck. Walker then revealed how he'd abducted his female victims at knife point, strangled them to death, and then discarded their bodies, beginning with Margaret Bell. He ended up uh, going with her and across to Arkansas and Tennessee and Kentucky. He killed her and ditched her body up in a wooded area near Paducah, Kentucky. Then took her vehicle and drove to Branson, Missouri, where he broke down. Uh, ended up hitchhiking out of there. Once Walker had told them where to look for Margaret Bell's car, Steve Tiffey contacted police in Branson. We contact them back and had them preserve the car. And then we went to uh, Branson, Missouri, where the car was impounded and processed the car. We were looking for fingerprints in the vehicle of uh, a possible suspect, any type of trace evidence of hair, body fluids, or, or anything of that nature. On inspecting the car, 
police found more than they were expecting. Eddie Cash's suitcase was found in her vehicle. It had some of Eddie Cash's uh, clothing and his name on the, on the suitcase. So that kind of tied the suspect to the Cash killing and Miss Bell's murder. According to Walker's confession, Margaret Bell's body was in Kentucky. They'd found a white female's body at a tobacco farm just off the interstate. Her body was nude except for the, the uh, clothing tied around her neck that was later determined that was the cause of death was strangulation. In the case of Janet Jewell, Walker had shown how devious he could be. He uh, saw her car parked in front of a store, and he saw her go inside. So he raised the hood of her car and unplugged the, uh, the cord going into her uh, coil wire. And when she came out and tried to start her car, she was unable to get it started. So then he, he asked if he could help and uh, he raised the hood and messed around for a little bit and then put the coil wire back in the coil. And then asked if he could have her slide over so he could try to start it. And when she did, pulled a knife on her, abducted her, took her to a remote area, raping and killing her, uh, left her body uh, off of the roadway. Valerie was abducted from the parking lot at Knife Point. We found out that she was raped several times. He was constantly threatening her life, and that she was begging for her life and saying, let me get back to my child. He forced her to go through drive throughs at banks a couple of times. And we were thinking, you know, at that point, boy, that would have been the point to yell, to scream for help, to do anything, jump out of the car, and it didn't happen. So he must have had her tied up in some way or restrained. And that had to be horrible. Walker led Detective Stanley Glanz to the bodies of Valerie Shaw Hartzell and Janet Jewell. Uh, he directed us out a... Uh, a road in, in Tulsa County, and she was laying in a ditch. How he killed her. He took a towel and rolled it up and uh, uh, put it around her neck and strangled her. And uh, in fact, uh, he got really emotional and started crying when we found Valerie. And then we got in the car again and headed towards the pulpa uh, looking for Janet Jewell. And uh, he took us down to the creek where he had left her. And I found her laying over a, a tree across the creek. Janet Jewell, he choked her with a cable. Knowing how Gary Allen Walker had killed his victims, the question everyone wanted answered was why. He had been convicted one or two times for stealing cars, and the victims had always come in and testified against him. So he felt if he killed those people that they, they couldn't testify against him. He felt he could stay in the car a lot longer than if he'd just steal it. So if he killed them, then he didn't have to worry about them reporting it to the police. One of the many disturbing facts to emerge was that Walker had finished serving a five-year prison sentence just three months prior to his horrific crime spree. With his confession and the victim's bodies found, the community geared up for Walker's impending trial, anxious to see justice done. But for the victim's families, the trial meant reliving the torture again. After a 27-day rampage across several southern states, Gary Allen Walker had finally been arrested. Everyone was relieved to know he was behind bars. Since Walker's crimes had occurred in several jurisdictions, trials were scheduled in separate counties. For the families and friends of the victims, it meant coming face to face with the man who destroyed their lives. 
The first time I saw Gary Allen Walker was at the courthouse for trial, and they were bringing him in, and he actually walked pretty close to me, and I just had that feeling. It's just kind of like when blood runs cold. You just um, feel really empty and just angry. And it always has stuck in my mind that that is the face, that's the look that every one of his victims saw, probably when they were being killed. During the trial, the increasingly grotesque details took their toll on families and friends, including colleagues of Valerie Shaw Hartzell. They showed photos of her body when it was found. At one point, I had to leave the courtroom and go out and just sit in the hallway for a while and then go back in. And that, that had never happened to me before uh, covering a murder case. Unable to have Walker's confessions thrown out, his lawyer attempted to elicit the jury's sympathy and downgrade his client's sentence from death to life imprisonment. His sister talked about what a horrible childhood that he had. But I think a, a relative of one of the victims said it best. He said, well, a lot of people have terrible childhoods, have horrible things happen to them, but they don't go out and murder and rape people. And I thought that was pretty apropos. During deliberations, the jury requested a tape of Walker's confessions. In the recording, Walker said he'd had no reason to kill his victims. He acknowledged he was going to die for what he'd done and admitted that if he was free, he would do it again. It didn't take long for him to be uh, convicted of the murder. Walker received the death penalty for killing Eddie Cash. He received six life sentences and 700 years in prison for his other crimes. I definitely felt it was just. There was some of the members of the family and some of, the, of my very close friends that were definitely against it, but I, I felt that it was something that needed to be done. There was a sense of accomplishment. When you dedicate that much resources to a case, it, uh, when it concludes, you're very pleased. In a short period in May 1984, Gary Allen Walker had killed five people, raped and kidnapped several more, and changed the lives of their families and friends forever. I didn't sleep well at night. I had my husband up in the middle of the night chasing ghosts because I would swear somebody was in the house. I was pretty much a nervous wreck and afraid of my own shadow for many years to come. I sought counseling immediately after and probably the last two to three years I've been able to do some healing. I will always remember my father as a very loving, caring person. He cared for his family, he cared for everyone he came in contact with. After a 16-year legal battle, Gary Allen Walker was executed by lethal injection on the 13th of January, 2000. It was time. Valerie had been my friend. I just needed some closure to it, and it closed it. it didn't fix it. And didn't fix it to her family and her child. But it was some closure.